the default base case expectation should be that the collapse of global banking and the collapse of the modern financial system, as cliche as that sounds, should theoretically be the fastest collapse of any industry in human history. Okay, welcome back to the Money Matters podcast today. I'm joined by a fellow Luke in the Bitcoin space. I believe he is also in his 20s, and I believe he is even more bullish than myself. Luke Broyles, <laughs> welcome to the podcast, brother. Thank you for having me. Um, yeah, how old are you? I'm, I'm 23. How old are you, Luke? Uh, you've got me beat. I feel like a, a goddamn grandma next to you. I'm 26, mate. Very okay, <laughs> okay, you're 26. Yeah, well, we're both very young. It's it's very interesting. I don't know if you noticed it, but over the last 18 months, the average age of Bitcoin enthusiasts, I think, has dropped by like 15 years. Um, back in 2021, a lot of people were in their mid to late 20s um, like us, but now it seems like uh, or has risen because I, I think a lot of people now are in their 30s and 40s. So I think all the youngsters have been forced out by bitcoin's number going down so um <laughs> so anyway it's 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 good to still have fellow young people in here it sure yeah. is we need more uh dylan leclerc's and will clementi's uh to back us up there luke um yeah, but we uh so there's lots of topics i want to discuss with you today i uh i think you're one of the most underrated names on twitter and uh i think you're already at uh fifteen thousand followers and when i initially messaged you luke i think you're on about two or three thousand so uh, I, I'm sure there's lots to discuss because uh, your content seems to be gaining lots of traction. Yeah, yeah, thank you. It's, it's definitely been a whirlwind. Um, pretty much everyone comments on how quick it's been. I appreciate the compliment. You think I'm underrated. Um, at the end of the day, I don't feel I have anything particularly unique to offer as far as understanding the market, but perhaps I offer a different perspective and articulation that has been really valuable for people. So I, I'm really looking forward to this conversation because there's a lot you and I agree on. And there are a few things we don't agree on. Uh, so I'm looking forward to discussing both. It should be a whirlwind. And let's start off with something that I think is uh, most commonly understood, uh, not only in the Bitcoin and the monetary space, but also the broader technological space. And that is exponential technology. And I think your first thread, you say something along the lines of, we are actually going to have, uh, what is it, less in common with someone uh, in 2020. Was it yeah. 21, 23, then somebody 19, yeah. 23. So explain to us that uh, theory you have there. Yeah, well, I mean, it's not even, well, the first thing, it's not even 1923, it's the year 23. So I don't, I mean, it, it, to me, it seems obvious that there's more change in the next 100 years than the last 100 years because technology is changing faster now. But I think it's even more than that because I think it's changing so fast now that the average person's life or many components of the average person's life will be so different 100 years from now compared to a couple thousand years ago. If, I mean, if we think about this right now, a significant portion of our daily communication in the workspace is online, whether it's through social media or through its Zoom calls or video calls such as this or other online communication. That was a completely foreign concept um, until you know a couple decades ago. The vast majority of people contacted literally 80, 90, 95% of all the people in their life through face-to-face real-time communication. And then life changed drastically when you have the and when you have literacy rates go up, you know, because for the vast majority of history, people were not literate. And so that changed a lot of things. And now you could travel messages to your peers across time. And then of course that's that rate of change has only gotten faster and faster as we've gone from handwritten letters to the printing press, from the printing press uh, to telegraph and to the landlines and then cell phones, the internet, and now all these kinds of communication we have here. So when it comes to communication uh, mechanisms, when it comes to how we use energy, when it comes to how we transport ourselves, our understanding of science, our understanding of the cosmos and everything else, we can basically think of history as a curve that's getting more exponential. And I think we're at the point that our next iteration of time has more changed than the last, say, 20 iterations of that same amount of time before us. So, you know, for example, I think the next year could have just as much change as multiple years before uh, before us. Or I think the next century uh, is the example I give, could have more change in the last thousand years, 2000 years, or even more. Likewise, when it comes to Bitcoin specifically, I think our current financial plan is very similar to that of Romans. 
You know, if you're a Roman, how do you save your money? You buy assets because you can't trust the political regime of your era, aka the emperor of Rome. You, and so you save your money in olive oil, oxen, uh, sheep, your flock. That's how you save money. You diversify your value in a set of consumer goods and products or maybe businesses that offer services in, in your era. And more or less, we're doing the same thing today. Because we can't trust the political currency of our current regime, a.k.a the United States dollar or wherever you're watching this from, we save money in a mixed basket of consumer goods. We're, we're offloading our risk onto things and assets and consumer goods because we can't justify having the risk in our underlying currency. Because we can't trust the dollar, we decide to trust other assets. But the problem with that is that we shouldn't trust those assets because what happens to gold, what happens to real estate, what happens to all these things is that we make more of them over time and we only make more of them faster over time. And so it's completely nonsensical to hold wealth in these things. And yet when you're in a world of bad money, it's the only thing that makes sense, even though it makes no sense. And I think we're entering the world where we actually finally possibly have good money. And in that world, all those assets reprice Oh, just for a moment, Luke, sorry to cut you off. Tell us more about political currency units. That seems like it's a new slogan in the Bitcoin space. So I want to hear more about that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's something that either I came up with or I don't remember where it came from, whether it came from someone else's brain or if I came up with it, but I, I don't remember seeing it anywhere else. But yeah, now I see it all over Twitter and, and that's that's quite interesting because I said that in one of my first threads. But the, the term comes from the idea that when we deal with what we typically call fiat currency, you know, I think that term is just fine. But I think it's hard for people outside of the finance, monetary, and Bitcoin space to know what that term means. What do you mean fiat currency? I mean, well, it, it seems complicated to them. But when you keep it that simple and just say political currency units, it's exactly what it is. The cash in your wallet is nothing but a given number of currency units of a given political regime. So again, if we go back to the Roman comparison, and you were to have you know, a silver coin, what you own is you own a piece of currency, a unit, a, fi a fixed amount of currency within that political system that is the Roman Empire. And why do people trust that currency? It's because they trust the Roman Empire more than other empires, because obviously Rome is the behemoth of its era. And likewise today, people trust the dollar of the United States of America as the global reserve currency, not because the piece of paper is any different or better than any other piece of paper, but they trust the political backing behind that currency unit because the might and the force of the United States military and of the United States Congress, the United States Constitution is backing the scarcity of that currency unit. If somebody just starts creating more of them, the U.S. government is going to crack down on them and enforce that scarcity via enforcing counterfeit law. And so basically what you're doing is you're trusting the, you're having fiduciary trust in that system of surviving and of maintaining and also maintaining the scarcity of its underlying currency because you don't only have to trust the political institution is going to survive into the future you have to trust that that political institution is going to maintain some form of cap on the total supply of the currency because they're two different things and sometimes people think i'm calling for the end of the u.s government uh when i'm saying that the dollar is just going to continue declining all that and and it's so I understand why people think that, but it's so frustrating because they're two entirely different things. You can believe that a political institution is going to survive and that they are going to re release the cap on their currency units. It's like they're sure they have some correlation and sometimes they often uh, have a correlation there and that as the political system declines, also they release their cap. You know, that I'm not... Um, Looking, I'm not glossing over that, of course, but they're not inherently the same thing. So I think, for example, the dollar will decline, but I think in relation to many other fiat currencies and political currencies of the world, if not all of them, the dollar will increase in value. I mean, for example, the U.S. dollar has just skyrocketed, the, the Dixie, the DXY, uh, over the last year or so because all the other currencies have fallen more. Obviously, the dollar has fallen in relation to everything else. It would be absurd to say the dollar is more valuable uh, inherently in of itself. But in relation to all the other fiat currencies, it's fallen less. And so therefore, the DXY goes up. And it's the same idea with, with Bitcoin. Yes, Bitcoin is down right now, but it is down much less than all these other fiat currencies 
are when you look back over the last five years, 10 years, 14 years, or wh whatever your time horizon is. And so looking forward to the future, I think that trend will just continue. And I think the innovation that comes from technology, again, to bring it back to technology, is a self-reinforcing prophecy. Because what happens when you have more innovation and you have more productivity, more prosperity, more efficiency in the economy, you drive real prices of assets and consumer goods down. So if you're, say, saving in real estate and gold, and all of a sudden all this innovation comes that makes them cheaper in real terms and a brute force physical cost it requires less effort to acquire that, well, all of a sudden you're putting more pressure on the issuer of that currency to continue issuing currency to keep the prices up. So th this is something Jeff Booth talks about a lot. This is something a lot of technologists and engineers talk about a lot. But that's basically the problem that we are in right now. We have this major force of exponential technological change that's only going to get more exponential as a function of time. And simultaneously, we have a slowly and steadily weakening financial system that requires increasing prices. Because without that, then you have a form of credit collapse. And I don't know when you're going to release this loop, but we're recording this on March 10th. And the news cycle has just been ridiculous the last 48 hours. The world was more or less normal a couple days ago for most Americans. And now all of a sudden we have, I don't even know what it is now, three banks that are in dire, dire situation. Um, we have what Silvergate and Silicon Valley and then First Republic. And then I'm hearing rumors of more. Obviously, they're all just rumors. Who knows what's true and what's not? But it, it's it's really treacherous. And even though I don't think this is the big one or the big event, I think it's going to be something like this. And that eventually, people will just have things freeze and we'll just push QE infinity and we'll just continue printing currency forever because we have to default. We either have to default and, and come back to reality either in nominal terms or real terms. So if we default in nominal terms, prices of everything just collapse back to where they should be, and the free market will figure out where that is. I don't know where that is, obviously. <laughs> if I knew what it was, I could run the global economy, but nobody can know that, so nobody knows. So if things collapse in nominal terms and prices come down, that's the Great Depression and, and prices coming down, it's the great collapse that everyone fears. But what I think is far more likely, and what I think people have a far more difficult time of understanding, is what if we take the easy route out? What if we delay that, take the easy route out, and instead just default in real terms, where the true value of these assets goes down, but instead of their exchange rate in terms of political currency units going down, the exchange rate just increases up to infinity. And I think you believe a very similar thing as well as most Bitcoiners and many Austrian economists out there, but... Um, it's, it's basically all the same idea, that we have less in common with the future than to do with the past. And I think if you are allocating your portfolio and your career and your skill set based on the skills and the allocations and the models of the last 50 years, I, I think that's a really big mistake because the last 50 years, more or less, have been an outlier. Post-World War II, this has been one of the greatest booms in human history. I would say the greatest one in human history. It's been a period of unparalleled globalization and of no war. And so what happens when all of a sudden the ledger has become distorted so far that eventually it has to come back to reality and things change. I'm an optimist for the future, but the reality is that we have massive systemic inefficiencies that have to be corrected. And they are either going to be corrected by flat out defaulting in nominal terms or pretending like we're not defaulting by expanding uh, the supply of currency forever. So I, I kind of combined two different ideas there, but that's that's the basic idea that you can't just take your assumptions from the past and assume the future is going to be the, the exact same because the rules of the system and the rules of how the world works because of technology are shifting exponentially faster. That's a great way to put it. I think the rules of the future are certainly changing and they're going to be very different yeah. to the past. Um, I wanted to double click on a point you mentioned before. You said something along the lines of <laughs> uh, the next 50 years is going to have more change than the past couple of hundred. I don't remember the exact figure you quoted yeah. there, but I, I couldn't agree sure. more. I, yeah, yeah, 100%. I even make a little bit of a provocative case in a recent article I wrote. I think the next 50 years could have more change in the past 1 million years of evolution that we've been through because I think the world is going to change so drastically. And like you say, we are 
on this exponential curve in terms of uh, human, uh, human flourishing, technological innovation. And I actually, when we're talking about exponentials, most people would be familiar with an S curve. You know, it takes around, you know, a certain number of years, let's say 10 to go from zero to 10% adoption. You hit an inflection point and then a technology goes for a really rapid period, period of adoption where it goes from say 10%, for example, to 90% adoption. And I kind of look at the, you know, the 1400s to the 1700s as a kind of inflection point on an exponential curve where innovation has been absolutely accelerated at such a ridiculous rate since then. Um, and I think there were some really major inventions and advancements in that period of time that has kind of put us on this exponential curve. Obviously, central banking is not really much of an innovation, but it increased monetary velocity in the 1600s. Yes. We found coal in the 1600s, which obviously increased energy density. Um, we obviously the printing press in the 1450s. Um, and I kind of look at that era as like an inflection point on the exponential curve. Um, I'd love to get your thoughts on that, Luke. I might slap a chart um, up on screen for the people watching this one after the fact, but I kind of see that era as like a, a modern day miracle, so to say, and it's, uh, really has yeah. put us on an exponential trend. Yeah, I, I don't know if I would agree with that. I, I agree with your larger point, but I don't know if I would say that it, this period was the year that changed or this century was the century that changed everything. I, I don't know if I would agree with that because that, that's really hard to pinpoint. I mean, you could say mm. that about the wheel. You could say that about the printing press. You could say that uh, about the discovery of the new world, perhaps. You could say that about the locomotive. I, I think the locomotive is often an underrated one, partly because it's so recent in history. I think, you know, I think the locomotive was a big deal. I mean, you know, there's, there's dozens of centuries and moments in history, or perhaps decades and moments in history, that I think you could argue that the world completely changed and it was never the same. And I, I think it's perhaps not necessarily wrong, but I, I think it's more correct to say that it's just a steady curve that's been going uh, forever. And so, yeah, we could point to something in the relative recent past of a couple hundred years ago and say that was the moment that really got us to this point really rapidly. I think that's true. But I think the farther back you look in time, I, I think it's true irregardless of where you are in time. And I do think Bitcoin is one of those moments. I do think that the two Lukes of 100 years from now or a couple hundred years from now will be looking back on Bitcoin's impact in history and view that as a before and after moment too. And that there was before Bitcoin and after Bitcoin. There, there, was, there was this long period of time where we didn't have the printing press and suddenly we have the printing press and all its descendants. There was this long period of time where horses were our main and only form of transportation and then we discovered the first mass transit system which was the locomotive and that changed everything there was this long period of time where we just had these cycles of empires regimes governments and political currency systems that rose and fell rose and fell rose and fell as a function of demographics and technology changing and then we discovered true mathematical scarcity in a decentralized network that has consensus aka bitcoin and then that changes everything. And I, I think that's a big part of what people fail to realize is that assuming Bitcoin is what we think it is and assuming it survives, it, it really is a major historical moment because in the same way that the printing press is what causes everyone to become literate, in the same way, I think Bitcoin is what causes everyone to become literate in money. I think I think really we don't know what money is and we just discovered what it is in a way. We, we we have been diversifying in a basket of assets and commodities that have gotten as close to money as we possibly can and now we just discovered it. I, I do think that's a real argument that needs to be made and I think that most people aren't aware of that and that's a big part of why it's so exciting to me and why I can spend <laughs> most of my days and thinking about this for many hours just because it's endlessly fascinating. I feel like, I feel like Luke, that I am in Britain in, in the early industrial revolution and I just saw the locomotive and there's only like five people I've met in real life that also have seen this thing. And it's like, I, I want to talk about this. I, I can't stop talking about it. It's like everyone I know is a horse breeder and they all use horses. And, and, and like, I'm trying to explain to people, it's like this big metallic thing that you think is useless and loud and expensive and slow and, and clunk, clunky and, and just a complete disaster. This thing that 
you don't understand yet, not because you're unintelligent, but just because you haven't taken the time to learn about it and because you haven't looked at it and you haven't seen it like I have, like this changes your children, your grandchildren's lives far more than you can possibly conceive. It's it's like it's fascinating to me because even if I was in, you know, the early 1800s and I saw that and I understood how radically the locomotive would change the world, I can't possibly imagine the world a mere 150 years later after that moment. Like even if I was in the year 1800 and I was trying to envision the year 1890, it's like I would probably be horribly wrong, probably really optimistic or really pessimistic in some ways or another. And there's no conceivable way that I could imagine the 21st century or even most of the 20th century. And likewise today, it's like if we assume humanity continues and this curve continues and we don't have some sort of major catastrophe that slows it down, it's like, you know, frankly, I have absolutely no idea what the year 2100 is going to look like. And I'm not even going to pretend to guess because I know that if I was in the year 1800, I could not see the world 100 years from then. So I would be a complete idiot to try and be arrogant enough to think that I could now. And so but like I tell people, I don't I don't know what the future is going to have, but I do know that assuming there isn't going to be a major collapse, there's going to be more change. It's going to be faster than what's been before. And in that face of change, we have a major problem that we've not had before. And that problem is that the curve is so steep now, it's within a single working lifetime. And in order to save one's purchasing power in the face of these exponentially increasing amounts of infinity of all these assets, the supply of all these assets, you need something that's finite. You know, like... Two years ago, the Optimus robot didn't exist. And now, you know, the video came out. It's like they're building themselves. It's like the only thing that makes sense to buy in a hyperabundant world of robots and AI and infinite supplies of everything or, or supplies of everything trending towards infinity, the only thing worth it to buy is something that is finite. It, and it seems to me Bitcoin is the only thing in the world, the only asset in the world that's finite. The only one so there is no yeah. second best luke yeah there is no, there is no second best it, it appears there's not <laughs> so <laughs> now i wanted to quickly interrupt today's chat with let you know about our amazing show sponsors if you are in the market looking to purchase a little bit more insurance on the fiat legacy financial system i would love to point you towards swan bitcoin they're a great bitcoin only educational company and they will also help you buy bitcoin easily and they're going to give you ten dollars of free bitcoin if you sign up using the link in the description of today's video we're thrilled to be partnering up with swan bitcoin they're a great company so definitely check them out and once you've bought your bitcoin if you're looking for somewhere to put that bitcoin in a safe place we recommend you check out the foundation passport hardware wallet it's one of the best hardware wallets there is in the space it's a high-end product visually very appealing and it has great qr code functionality which makes sending and receiving bitcoin an absolute walk in the park so if you want ten dollars of that puppy you can use promo code beast and last but not least let's hear from our final show sponsor today that is of course the bitcoin miami 2023 conference you guys can get 10 percent off your tickets if you use promo code coin beast again links to all the show sponsors are in the description of today's video let's get back into this discussion i definitely want to get to bitcoin uh shortly um i want to definitely double click once again on that point you made about locomotives because i was writing about that just last week and i think for thousands of years if not tens of thousands of years an average day everyday human could not only they couldn't dream about traveling at faster than 10 miles per hour for, you know hundreds and you know thousands of years then the locom the locomotive comes along and then only 150 years into the future we land on the moon traveling yeah. in a goddamn yeah. rocket ship that travels at 25,000 miles per hour so you yeah. go from 10 miles per hour to 25,000 in the space of 150 years it's yeah. inconceivable yeah yeah exactly I mean, I mean again that goes back to a larger point of in response to my first thread, some people try to ask me, like, what do you think it'll, the world will look like? And it's just, I have my own thoughts and opinions, but I don't I don't say them because I know I'm going to look like an idiot probably as soon as 10 years from now. And and I know that it, it's also pointless. Because it's like, we have no idea. We we just don't. We we can't. Our brains aren't designed to think that way. We, we have, we work on linear thinking. You know, we, we can't possibly understand the, the future. What, one of my favorite examples is that of uh, an example Jeff Booth gives uh, frequently about how if you take a piece of paper, you probably know this, but if you take a piece of paper 
you fold it in half, you know, obviously it's twice the thickness of a piece of paper. And I think it's if you fold it, what, what does it help me out here? 30 times? 30 50. To, 50. 50 times it reaches the sun, right? And so, like, that's pretty amazing. If you fold a piece of paper, you know, like, as thin as a human hair or just about that, that thin, 50 times. If you double that length 50 times, you reach the sun 93 million miles away. And so then you ask someone, well, what, what does 100 folds look like? And they're like, well, I don't really know. And you tell them, well, 83 folds or 82 folds. I think it's 83 folds reaches Saturn. It's like, oh wow, okay, that's 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 a long distance, or something like that. But a hundred folds goes across the entire observable universe. Yeah. And so it's it's like even though I can say these things, I can't possibly intuitively understand it. Like it's literally impossible. And the same way with technology, I could say things I think the future would look like, but I can't have any idea if that's true or not. Because whatever intuition I have, I know almost inherently has to be incorrect. And when it comes to Bitcoin, this is one of the things people have a very hard time understanding and why I continue to emphasize to people it's very early. Because people look at the price and they think it, may or, it must be a bubble because it's been so exponential. And people aren't thinking about that in, in terms of the future. They're just looking at a number on a screen and reacting emotionally to that. There's no logic to it. Bitcoin has gone from six cents, aka basically zero, to sixty-five thousand at its all-time high, or sixty-eight, sixty-nine thousand at its all-time high, with just a few million users. Like it breaks all valuation models, and people have trouble understanding it. And yet, when you view it from that lens of what's really happening here is that this system per user is worth exponentially more than every previous system because the qualities and the features and the foundational realities of the system are exponentially more valuable than previous systems. So of course it's going to be worth more. In, in, of course it's going to be more valuable in aggregate and per user than previous systems because this technology is exponentially more valuable, because it's not corruptible, because it's immutable, because it's actually finite. Uh, you know, so And then when you factor in all the users that are yet to enter, it's like, again, every price for Bitcoin becomes less absurd the longer out in, in time you look so anyway all, all that to say is that we have no idea what the future is going to look like but it seems to me bitcoin is a really really essential part of that and it seems to me that the vast majority of people have 95 to 100 percent exposure in things that are going to be forced to zero the fastest in history because the, inter the internet was great but another way of looking at the internet was it was the fastest collapse of a series of communication paradigms in human history. You know, if you were in radio, if you were in tele cable television or newspapers or had landlines or all that, it's like your industry died faster than every any other industry in human history. And so it's like my loving little bit of paranoia for people that don't have a very high, alloca high allocation of Bitcoin, especially for those that don't have any allocation of Bitcoin, is this, is that if we assume technology just continues, and if we assume the most secure computer network, computing network in the world, aka Bitcoin, survives, the default base case expectation should be that the collapse of global banking and the collapse of the modern financial system, as cliche as that sounds, should theoretically be the, the fastest collapse of any industry in human history. And then add on top of that, the financial incentives that you and Adam Bath both go into that have you guys think it's going to be even faster than what that base case assumption should be. So really, it's very, I, I don't like to use extreme words without reason, but I think it's entirely reasonable to say the situation is dire for everything that's not in Bitcoin. And it's very early. It may not feel that way, but it takes human brains years to think about this and try to understand it. Uh, it took me years to understand Bitcoin. It probably took you years to understand Bitcoin. And if, say, there's going to be 20 years worth of change in the next eight years or five years or three years or 10 years, however much it's going to be, it's like human brains don't learn exponentially faster. We learn at a linear rate and we have multiple exponential trends occurring here. And I think if people wait five years to start learning about Bitcoin, by the time they understand it and they've adjusted accordingly, the world will have already outdated them to a severe degree and it will only get more difficult for them to catch up. 
not that not that they eventually won't, but I think they will eventually have to just go with the tide and not really understand what's happening. So anyway, I've said a lot there, but those are some basic musings of mine. <laughs> <laughs> keep the musings coming brother i was never going to cut you off again there were some great musings i uh i actually i used the example of the folding a piece of paper 50 times uh, i used it the other day on the girlfriend and her uh, jaw dropped because i asked her obviously okay if i fold the piece of paper 50 times how thick is it going to be she goes uh um you know say yeah. about that thick and yeah, i say a few, well, feet, a few meters maybe a couple miles but yeah 93 million miles is not the <laughs> Yeah, and again, it's like it, it's not as Jeff Booth says. It's not a part of the trick. It's like the point there is not that oh you don't get it. You should just you know trust me. But it's like no, no. The point is none of us can understand it. Mm. Not a single human on earth can intuitively understand that because human brains just aren't wired for that. Exactly. Something else you said there, Luke, was uh, we are early. We are early to Bitcoin. Yeah. And I'd love, I'm going to pull up, it's not exactly a quote, but he did a really interesting thread just actually highlighting how early we were to Bitcoin. Uh, you ran a couple of assumptions. In the first assumption I want to touch on, you said, okay, assuming there's 16 million Bitcoin available for sale today, uh, to be a part of the top 1.4% uh, of people into the future, you would only have to own 0 0.006 Bitcoin today and only 80 million other people on the earth could actually own that amount of Bitcoin. Uh, how did you put that table together? And uh, uh, thank you for putting it into numbers because it was brilliant. Yeah, thanks. Um, you know, see, the, the hard thing is that when people hear me say, oh, we're early, they think that it's similar to like a penny stock or some of this and that. It's like, oh, you're early. You could still get in all that. It's like, I, I understand why people have that cognitive bias and they bring that in and they think that I'm trying to promote some scheme here. But reality is I have to say it because it's true. Even if people misunderstand it, I have to keep saying it because otherwise people aren't eventually going to realize what I'm really saying unless I say it. And what I'm really saying there is that we are early and people need to stop thinking they're late just because the number on the screen is different. Like right now, Bitcoin is roughly $20,000 and it is crazy early. And when Bitcoin is $20 million, I know people are going to probably roll their eyes at me saying this, but when Bitcoin is 2 million, 200,000, 20 million, you know, a hundred to a thousand X higher in its exchange rate to the U S dollar than today, like it will still probably be early. And it, it sounds unbelievable, but I genuinely believe that's the case, that Bitcoin will be trading at millions of dollars and the vast majority of people still will not have adopted and it will still be early. Now, people hear that and they think, oh, well, f for if Bitcoin took 14 years to go from zero to 20,000, then it must take decades for it to get from 20,000 to 20 million. Possible, but I, I don't think that's nearly as likely as people assume. And, and so the larger point being there is that we are early and because we're early, stop focusing on price and start focusing on underlying adoption. And that's where I got my numbers for that spreadsheet that you're referring to, that all I did was I plugged in numbers for adoption. You know, there's 5.36 billion adults on earth. You know, today, there'll be billions more in the future, but today there's 5.3 billion. And then we assume, you know, there's tens of billions of companies, corporations, and then roughly 200 uh, nation states or large entities like that. So I basically plugged it all together based on a current period distribution of global wealth. And you do the math and that's what you get. That statistically speaking, if we assume that the vast majority of entities over 98, 99% of entities on earth adopt Bitcoin, then that's what we're looking at there. And perhaps it's not 100% of their balance sheet, but if we divide it out, that's, that's what they have. It's like most millionaires and multimillionaires and large companies, you know, 63 million millionaires will add in 17 million large companies, which, you know, depending on your sources and definitions or whatever, you could increase or decrease that number as much as you want, basically. But to me, that seemed like the most reasonable number, you know, 80 million, just to keep it at a even, evenly rounded number and then evenly rounded 6% of a Bitcoin. I mean, the math works out and that easily absorbs the entire supply of the 16 million Bitcoin. And I think there will be significantly less Bitcoin available than 16 million. And so I think that's what people really appreciate about that is that I took current wealth distribution and current conservative estimates for the total supply 
of Bitcoins and just did the math. And that's the problem, Luke. Most people just don't want to do the math. And that's why we're always surprised when technology changes faster than we expect. And we're always surprised, just like people online are surprised now, that banking institutions can become over insolvent just like that. Like it, it's, it's terrifying how as we become a world that's much more logarithmic and much, le much less linear, how much more reliant we are on math and models and how much less our intuition has anything make any sense. So yeah, we're, we're very early and if any, if people can just get off zero, like they're, they're fine. Um, if someone can get off zero today, they're probably going to be all right. As long as they keep their keys and don't sell and all that, of course, but there'll probably come a day in the not horribly too distant future where people will be forced to sell enormous amounts of their net worth for what today are extremely small amounts of Bitcoin. And that curve will only get more dramatic, I believe. So, I agree. I think the curve is also going to get steeper and steeper and steeper. And I enjoyed that. I enjoyed that thread because it laid out two different uh, estimations on how much Bitcoin uh, you need and what that's going to be worth in the future. Uh, first, we talked about the conservative uh, estimate. But then you also had a little bit more of a bullish estimate. And this is more kind of how I see like, it. Like the first one wasn't enough that 6% <laughs> of a Bitcoin's more than a company. Well, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, the second one, I just took a more, a, a, an even more bullish number, which again, I think is entirely realistic, a 4 million Bitcoin. Why do I think that? Well, it's roughly 67, 68% of Bitcoins today are held by the crazy lunatics like you and me that will hold to literal zero. And oftentimes people think that's a bad thing and that means it's gonna be giant wealth inequality. I don't think that's the case for reasons I don't know if we really wanna get into here. That's a long explanation. But, but basically, if we assume that all the data is correct and that there's roughly two, 2.2 million Bitcoins left on exchanges, assuming they're not lying, which they very well might be. And we also uh, assume that Bitcoin continues to survive <laughs> which to me is a pretty safe assumption and that there's roughly two million or just under two million bitcoins left to be mined that's roughly four million bitcoins total and you divide that out and it's basically just exactly four more than the first model so instead of six percent of the bitcoin that's uh, what 1.5 percent of a bitcoin for the average company and, and the point i want to make there too the additional point is that the average company of the future will have much more prosperity and value th flowing through it than today's companies like today's most valuable companies are companies that make these little devices we call smartphones and channel coal and natural gas and all those things. But what if in the future, these little smartphone things are outdated, ancient, and laughable because the Mediacom telecommunications companies of the future are doing things that are 100 times more valuable than this and 100 times bigger than this, 100 times cheaper. And, and but the point being that to me, it's entirely possible that 1% or 2 or 3% of a Bitcoin is far more value, like real value and prosperity than any of us can possibly conceive of. And that's not hopium. Perhaps it is, but it's not coming from a place of hopium. It's just doing the math. There's X number of companies. There's Y amount of Bitcoin. And if we assume that total, that the total pie of prosperity in the future is going to be larger than today and we know for a fact how many shares of global monetary stock there are it's like it's, it's that simple the pie is going to grow the share of monetary stock stays the same therefore that share of monetary stock assuming that monetary system survives should be mind-blowingly uh, more than we can possibly conceive of yeah that's kind of how i see the future playing out um i get a little bit of hate mail on twitter luke when i call real estate a shit coin uh because i think bitcoin's going to demonetize a lot of these asset classes around the world i'm going to pull up a little bit of a uh screen grab or a quote from one of your tweets um and you're kind of talking about how bitcoin's going to inter interact with all of these other asset classes and your quote here goes but my stocks my bonds my cash and you say <laughs> zero zero and zero much faster than you think. <laughs> Tell me more, Luke. Why is it all trending towards zero? And why is it going to do it faster than most people can imagine? Yeah, people people really loved that one. I've gotten both a lot of love and a lot of hate off that one. <laughs> but yeah, the basic idea being that, again, we have 
a lot and similar with what we call ancient societies. I'd argue we're part of the ancient society. The people of tomorrow will view us as an ancient society, along with the Romans and the Egyptians and the Dutch and the British empires. They'll view all of it as ancient. And, and I mean, and that's because we already view it as ancient. You know, to us, the, the Victorian era and the height of the Roman era, they have more in common with each other than they have in common with us. And so we are, they are more technologically ancient to us than the Romans were technologically ancient to the British, you know? So, so in the same way, I think the future will view us just as ancient as them. And our current ancient practice that we're doing is that, like I was explaining earlier, we're saving in these assets and we're giving them a monetary premium because we can't give the monetary premium to our money because the money's corrupt and the money doesn't work and the money trends towards zero over time exponentially. We have to give that monetary premium to everything else. When the money is bad and you can't monetize your money, everything else has to be monetized. And this is why people feel that there's an everything bubble, why people are freaking out and they feel that everything's too high and why they fear that there's going to be a nominal price correction because we think that the assets are being overbid and they're being overblown. When in reality, the problem is that the monetary premium that should be in the money is flowing out because it can't survive there. And as the money continues to become less and less trustworthy and more and more monetary premium flows out of that money, it has to continue pushing asset prices up in term in terms of that form of money. And so the flow of energy is going from the money to the assets. What happens when all of a sudden that form of money is worthy of monetary energy because it's dependable, because it's immutable, because it's outside the control of humans? Well, that monetary energy has to flow back. That pendulum has to swing back over. And so what happens? Well, I think that different asset classes will face different hardships. Uh, you referred to real estate uh, as going down. I do think that's true in Bitcoin terms and in real terms. I think the much higher risk are bonds and cash and stocks, personally. And the reason I think that is because the vast majority of people, when they're saving money for retirement or they're saving money just for, in the same way they would save money for any form of monetary premium, the vast majority of what they do is they buy stocks and bonds and saving cash and gold as well. Um, so I think different asset classes will suffer to a different degree. I think one pro that real estate has that these other asset classes don't have is that it does have a consumer good value. It, the land is physical, it's tangible, and the building on top of it is physical and tangible. Whereas the paper of stock is just equity and the cash flows of that company. And what happens when margins get squeezed? Um, you know, that that's just something more or less made up that can... Uh, go down and bonds are even more hot air. So, you know, just spitballing here. If 90 to 99% of bonds are entirely monetary premium, that's a massive, massive portion, almost the entirety of it, that theoretically should decrease uh, in value as that monetary premium flows to sound money, which I believe is Bitcoin. Stocks are different. It, again, it depends almost entirely what stock we're talking about and what nation we're talking about. I'm in the United States, so I think the risk for the United States stock market is much greater than other stock markets because when investors, both domestic and foreign, invest in stocks, where do they put their money? They put their money in the stock market that is the most reputable, the most monetizable, the most dependable, and that is the American stock market. I mean, if you look at foreign stock markets, they are more or less flat. Uh, it, in nominal terms. And when you look at the American stock market, it's exponential in nominal terms, but it's flat when measured against the currency that we price it in, the US dollar. It, it's flat in real terms, but it's exponential in nominal terms. And, and so I think that monetary premium will collapse uh, back to where it should be. Perhaps that's perhaps stocks have a 60%, 50%, 70%, 40%. I don't know, uh, but they have a large monetary premium, less than bonds, but probably more than real estate. And so that's just for the next couple decades we're looking at here. Longer than that, obviously, these things continue uh, to go down. So first, the monetary premium gets absorbed as it transitions into the good form of money. And then the consumer good and, and the, the val everything else that's not monetary premium, eventually that continues um, to get eaten down because the monetary adoption will be much faster than the hyperabundance of everything else. And both will still be very fast, but... Anyway, at the end of the day, for the for most people, they could ignore everything I've said in the last few minutes and basically just take home that essentially all of the assets besides Bitcoin, obviously, should theoretically continue to go down in price against Bitcoin theoretically forever. 
and that crash theoretically should only get faster and faster and faster. And so again, because humans have linear thinking, we assume Bitcoin is high risk because it's volatile. And it's like, what if the lowest risk money of the future world of tomorrow is one that is volatile, that can accurately reflect the volatile prosperity gains of society? Because we can't have the dollar do that. We can't have the dollar, we, we can't have the dollar reflect that. Because if we do, we have a credit collapse. We can't let the dollar get too volatile in either direction. And because we're in our current world, we think that means it's safe. But what happens in the future world where prosperity is so fast, we require a form of volatile money that can adjust those productivity gains or losses virtually immediately, uh, or, or at least much, much orders of magnitude faster than the dollar can. So anyway, all that to say is that, yeah, I, I do believe every other asset besides Bitcoin will continue to trend down towards zero against Bitcoin theoretically forever. And that's why Bitcoin is often called the monetary singularity and why I call it a black hole because it's basically going to absorb everything else because the flow of energy instead of going from bad money to less bad assets is going from bad assets to perfect money. That's a brilliant way to um, analogize that. I use killed two birds with one stone. I was going to ask you about the monetary yeah. singularity and the yeah. monetary black hole. Uh, so you tick these ones off the list. Now, I want to ask you a few questions that I haven't heard many people ask you. I've listened to all of oh your boy. podcasts. <laughs> oh, all of them. Great. Yes. Oh, That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. No, please ask me the hard questions. I know we disagree on some things. So hit me with them. Oh, no, no. It's been a very bullish week for me, consuming all of your content, Luke. It was it was good fun. Uh, but there, no hard questions. Um, I, on, on some of your uh, podcasts, you kind of say uh, technology is going to continue to be exponential unless something really, really bad oh, yeah. and catastrophic happens. So lots of people obviously talking about uh, nuclear war today and artificial intelligence. Um, what are some of the biggest risks that you see that could potentially cause a catastrophic event for civilization? Yeah, um, I've gotten some, I was just on Simply Bitcoin and he asked me this too about what, why, why do I think that? And, and the basic reason, just to explain it to your viewers, the reason is kind of like we were saying earlier, we have this momentum that's been building up decade after decade, century after century, for multiple millennia. And even though the empires rise and fall and they cycle and cycle and cycle, the global aggregate of human progress has been really stable. Because when Rome falls, all the other empires are rising up. And I think people tend to forget that. I think there's good times and bad times in global human history. And it's like, in specific regions, there are good times and bad times. And so anyway, I think people forget that. And so we've been building up this momentum continually. And I think if we don't continue to have that momentum into the future, it's because a greater force has slowed that momentum or, or even the, in the worst case, stopped or even reversed that momentum. And the kind of event it would take for the vast majority of the globe today to stop progress at the speed that we're doing, that we're having progress. I mean, to me, it's something completely catastrophic. So anyway, irregardless of what those threats are, that's the basic idea that either we are going to continue the momentum or we're not. And the only way that we don't continue the momentum is if something disastrous happens, whether it's from an external force, an internal force, or something that we've just never experienced before. Uh, I think those are the only two inevitable paths. And then you factor in as well that the human population is still increasing. Uh, you know, we'll have billions more people in the next couple of decades. It's like, it's pretty obvious to me we have to increase the momentum or we have to continue the momentum. So. What do I think those threats are specifically? Um, I do have them listed out and in ranking of what I find the most concerning and, and most probable. Um, the, the three that come to mind for me, well, actually there's more than three, but a couple that come to mind, I do think nuclear war is a threat. Just, it seems to me it's overblown because of media and boobies and horror TV shows. The, the reality is that while our nuclear arsenals are immense and they're massive, we to me, and I, I've read studies on this and lots of papers, it, to me it seems absurd to think that we have enough nuclear firepower to permanently destroy the climate of Earth. Um, that This idea of the entire globe becoming a nuclear winter desert wasteland and humans are living underground, surviving on scraps, like to me that's absurd. We have enough firepower to destroy most of our cities. So yeah, I, I think nuclear war is a problem. I do think 
some people tend to over dramatize how serious of a problem it is if it occurs and i do think other people scoff it off too much i think it's more probable that we like to admit and i think probably the consequences of it are less disastrous than we think however i i don't particularly enjoy talking about this as much as the larger point the larger point is that to me the greater threat is whatever's next because say we were to travel back in time to 100 years ago uh, from today in 1923 and we were having this conversation our conversation would be can you imagine world war III Two, because World War Three hasn't happened yet. Could you imagine a world war where chemical weapons and we all just use mustard gas on each other? Oh, that would be horrible. And obviously, for the time, that was the rational conclusion that chemical weapons were the worst weapons known to man. But of course, a mere twenty years later, we we discovered and invented the nuclear bomb. And so, I do think the nuclear bomb is a threat today. But I think inherently the weapons that will be the most destructive in the future world are the weapons that have not been invented yet. So perhaps the nuclear bomb is the largest threat today. Perhaps it is. But I think weapons that we either can barely conceive of or we haven't even conceived of of the future are much more concerning, which is why it's very important that humanity finds a way to project a brute force physical cost on each other in the form of energy and electricity and watts instead of mass and bloodshed and the barrel of a gun. So so I, I think nuclear weapons is one of those. Um, I think someone engineering and designing a super virus is another one of those. Um, I don't really want to comment on <laughs> 2020 and everything like that, but uh, I mean, I guess I will. Why not? <laughs> Go for but, it. You know, it, 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 it's become pretty clear now that what was once considered conspiracy theory is now essentially fact or as close to fact as we can determine the American... Uh, Department of Energy has admitted that it's more probable than not, essentially, that the COVID-19, if I can say that, virus was from human origin. It was probably from a lab and not from a bat, um, which in, in hindsight seems kind of obvious. Um, you know, I don't think we really have to go down that rabbit hole, but to me, it, it seemed probable. And it seems to me in the future that if we if we can do that today like how much cheaper will that become in the future and how much more accessible will that become to bad actors and the problem with that is that we we don't know how good we can get at designing and engineering viruses or nanotechnology or technologies today they're just in their infancy we don't know how good we can get we don't know how efficient we can get and therefore i think it's more or less silly to try to predict what the destructive weapons of the far out future are uh, a more immediate threat that I think could be that kind of event would be some sort of EMP or CME that takes out the global electric grid or at least a considerable portion of the electric grid. I, I think that would be a disaster. Uh, it probably wouldn't set us back more than a couple decades maybe, but, uh, but that, that would be very bad. If we took out the global electric grid, uh, it wouldn't be the end of society. We would just continue back. We'd be back right where we are today in a dec few decades or whatever. After that, it wouldn't be the end of the world, but it would be, it would be a monumental moment. Um, but, but all I had to say is that, yeah, there are risks. I'm, I'm not going to pretend like I know what they all are. And I, I think at the end of the day, one has to stick to the first principles and say that even though we don't know what these threats are, we know that they have to get bigger, you know, in the same way that the cannon was much more destructive than every form of weapon and destruction before it. And, and in a similar way, that again mustard gas or a nuclear bomb all those things um you know we don't know perhaps we can create synthetic black holes in the future who knows <laughs> you know and, and it, maybe it's not even a weapon or a war maybe it's a scientific experiment gone wrong like we have no idea uh what kinds of innovations are in the future both in a positive light and a negative light so yeah there are risks and i do think they need to be mentioned but i think speculating on what they are is more or less a fool's errand mm. so yeah, those are just some thoughts. And then, oh, artificial intelligence, too. We didn't even talk about that. But I think Elon Musk is probably right that AI is a major threat. Yeah, I agree. I kind of view it a very similar framework there. I kind of only like to stress about things we can control. And I think something we can control is accelerating Bitcoin adoption. I think the world's going to be a better place on a Bitcoin standard. Yeah, yeah. And I don't want to come across as too pessimistic. Sometimes people think that I'm a doom and gloomer. And it's like, yeah, these are all threats. But it's like, at the end of the day, to me, it's... It's nonsensical worrying about these things of the future that we can't even understand. That we're pretty. It's like I, I don't see any reason to worry about it. Uh, and like you said, I believe Bitcoin's adoption helps mitigate those risks. 
and um, I don't know if we have time to get into that here, but it's just second order effects that Bitcoin reduces the financial, monetary, and political incentive to destroy other political regimes. And it destroys the incentive to corrupt food. It destroys the incentive to incite terrorism. It, it, it destroys a lot of incentives that today are just un unfortunate inefficiencies of an in inefficient economy and monetary base. And so if Bitcoin is not going to make humanity more moral, I like to say, but I do believe Bitcoin will reduce the economic incentive acting immorally. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think it aligns incentives towards the best case for everyone. And it, it seems to me that even if Bitcoin fails, it's it's the most rational thing one can do if one wants to have an optimistic future in a world of weapons that we can't even imagine yet. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin is hope, uh, as Sailor says. Uh, Luke, earlier you mentioned uh, the fact that we did disagree on some minor things. And I honestly completely <laughs> forgot we were discussing this on Twitter because we agree on so much. So I quickly yeah. looked in our DMs as you were uh, orange pilling the audience and the listeners uh, a few minutes ago in the discussion. And I found what we disagreed on. It was the timeline of Bitcoin's adoption. So I made the uh, fool's errand, uh, the beginner's mistake, to always put a little bit of a timeline on my predictions. I have been on the record for many years that I believe by the year 2030, uh, we're going to be left with less than five currencies around the world. So I'm a big dollar milkshake maximalist, and I think we're going to watch a wave of fiat currency hyperinflations, and we're going to watch hyperdollarization over the next five or so years, followed by hyperbitcoinization. Uh, so let's maybe just discuss some timelines there. I think by 2030, we're going to be left with less than five currencies around the world, the US dollar, Bitcoin, maybe the Chinese yuan, the euro and the Japanese yen, if they're lucky. Yeah, um, yeah, th th those, yeah, that's... Um, bullish? It, yeah, that's really bullish. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. <laughs> what i like about you is that like me you're not afraid to be bold and some people like it some people don't um i actually agree with you a lot on that i think the five strongest currencies over the next few decades will be those five the four major central banks and bitcoin uh probably the yen or it probably the yens if, if we had to pick four probably the yen would go uh maybe maybe the pound would be in there too but um uh, but really it's like there's those and everything else. Um, and, you know, I would argue Japan maybe is not even in that. Maybe it's just Euro, Yuan, and Dollar and Bitcoin. Um, but then even beyond that, perhaps it's just Yuan, Dollar, Bitcoin. I mean, you know, it, it, it's all guessing. But, I mean, the, the timeline of 2030, I mean, I just, I, I mean, I, I'd love to hear your thought process on that because I hear that and I'm like, wow <laughs> that i mean that's that's less than seven years away mm. and you think 140 of the 144 145 of the world's fiat currencies are are gonna like go to zero i mean i i mean look i i agree with you much more than the vast majority of people i mean we, we have what eight nations right now that are in hyperinflation i mean we have what lebanon uh, Argentina, Venezuela, Turkey, Lebanon, wait, Sri Lanka. Lebanon. Could you throw Sri, yeah, Sri Lanka? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sri Lanka, and um, I'm forgetting a couple. I feel so awful right now. But oh, Nigeria, uh, Nigeria being one. But there, there's there's already almost a dozen or just under a dozen nations that are like already beginning their final descent or their currency's final descent. Uh, but to me, it's like a hundred and 100 120 yeah for the next seven years i mean i don't know that that to me just seems like a lot um i, I guess what i would say is that <laughs> I, I don't know i i don't like putting a time prediction in mind and, and and you very much do and i guess that's more just a stylistic thing we have different but to me i, I guess what i would say is i pretty much agree that 100 plus currencies will be basically at zero at some point in the next couple decades, I do think that's more probable than not. But to, to think that it, the most likely scenario is the next seven years, all this occurs, I, I think, I think that's quite a lot. Just because, it, and and part of that too is that money is a function of human perception and human trust. And so I think it's going to take a lot longer for a critical mass of people. Not everyone has to understand, but a critical mass of people to understand. Like right now, there's three to five million Bitcoiners, I would argue, three to five million. I mean, 
by the time we're at 50 million, 100 million or so, like I think we'll be at that point where we can start making educated guesses of how close we are. Because like 100 million people, like that's one in 50. Like if one in 50 or one in 30 people of the traditional the fraction reserve system start leaving and taking everything with them onto a Bitcoin standard. I mean, that that to me, that's like critical mass because you do one or two more um, generations of Bitcoiners after that and, and that's everyone. So, but I mean, I don't know. That just seems extremely bullish. I, I'd love to hear why you think that. Okay. I, I wasn't going to go into my reasoning, but I'll, I'll touch on it. No, please do. Okay. Yes. I'll hand you the mic, Luke. You can be the interviewer. I'll be the interviewee. Uh, I'm essentially, uh, I'm bearish on central planners and fiat currencies, um, and I'm bullish on Bitcoiners, and I'm bullish on billionaires. Uh, so we've kind of discussed uh, in this video, there's only 2 million Bitcoin left on exchanges for sale. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Michael Saylor has 150,000 odd Bitcoin to his name, and yeah, one hundred thirty-eight thousand. Yeah, and he yeah. and he uh, he says, you know, I'm not selling this for a hundred years. You know, it could be a little bit of exaggeration, but he's yeah. probably going to hold that for a long time. Well, there's five thousand billionaires in the world. If there's only enough Bitcoin on exchanges for another fifteen of those billionaires or Michael Saylors to figure out what Michael Saylor has figured out, and then actually go and accumulate a similar size uh, in position as Michael Saylor, because I think they're going to be forced to actually come to this realization as Bitcoin begins to slowly monetize. So I I see, I see a lot of the rich, world's richest people as being selfish. They look at you know their net worth um, in terms of uh, like on a leaderboard. And as Michael Saylor slowly, slowly climbs that leaderboard of the world's richest people, I see the other people like Elon Musk and Tim Cook and Bill Gates watching Michael Saylor come after uh, their net worths and their only way to be at number one of the world's richest. Oh, it just did it to me again. I think the audio. Oh, no. I'm, I'm still here. We're still going? Okay. I'm still here. Yeah. Um, so so the, the only way for Bill Gates and co to become, so the only way for Bill Gates and Tim Cook to stay richer than Michael Saylor is to accumulate a sizable uh, Bitcoin position that is equivalent to Michael Saylor's 138 or 150,000 uh, Bitcoins that he has. So I see it getting very competitive up there in terms of uh, Bitcoin allocation. That's one of my reasonings. Um, we can get into more, but what do you think about that competitive yeah, dynamic? No, I, I, I love that, first of all. I, I sometimes say to people, like every company will become a Bitcoin acquisition mm -hmm. company within the next 20 years, 25 years or so. And every company that doesn't become a Bitcoin acquisition company ceases to be, be a company in the same way that today like every company is an internet company like even if they don't provide internet you know even if they're not like an internet company it's like they have to use the internet you know like even if they're a handyman or it's like they ha like who uses who does it use it anyway who uses yellow pages it's like every company has to upgrade adopt it in the same way it's like every company will have to transition to bitcoin and convert their cash flows into bitcoin and likewise every billionaire if they want to remain on the world's richest list will have to become a Bitcoin billionaire. And same thing with countries. Every central bank that wants to survive will no longer become a central bank that exchanges political currency units and fixed income, you know, debt like bonds. They'll become a bit a centralized Bitcoin acquisition institution. And they'll print their own currency and buy Bitcoin with that currency to back that currency and force their own fiat currency to die at a faster and faster rate exponentially to become a Bitcoin. So, so anyway, first of all, I love your point. I agree with that. But again, it's just seven years is just seems so short to me. I mean, you know, we have maybe a dozen billionaires or centimillionaires to understand Bitcoin. Maybe it's more like a hundred. I, I don't know. I mean, we really don't know that too much, but Michael Saylor at least is like one of the three only prominent billionaires that has an allocation of Bitcoin above like 5%. I, I can think of Sailor, there's Bill Miller, and there's probably a couple others that have a sizable allocation. But I mean, you know, f for me, my, my thinking is like, I don't think most will begin paying attention to Sailor and the Bitcoin thesis again until probably 2024, just because that's human psychology works. I don't think people will be paying attention until Bitcoin 70,000 plus US dollars. And so for me, then it's like, okay, now we're talking like five years or left. I, I, I just, I don't know. I, I just don't see it that fast. I see everything you see. I just don't see it that fast. To me, that seems um, wildly optimistic. What, one thing I do think is true, though, that you cited is that how 
when a technology exits the innovation stage and it enters the early adopter stage, it has like roughly 10 to 15 years or so. I forget the chart you shared, but it has roughly that long before it reaches like that critical mass adoption. Same thing with the internet, same thing with phones, same thing with previous forms of technology. I think that's true with Bitcoin too. It's just, I don't think we're anywhere close to two and a half percent global adoption. And it, it seems like you do or you did it, or I, I don't know, perhaps I'm putting words in your mouth, but I don't know. To me, I don't think one in 50 people on earth understands this. So I don't know. What, what do you think? If, if you had to put a number on adoption or better question, how do you define adoption? There you go. Because it seems we define it differently. Yeah, I think everybody defines it differently. Uh, I think in a 2021 article I wrote uh, looking at Bitcoin's adoption curve, I kind of laid out and kind of said there's going to be like three different uh, S curves. So there's going to be the S curve uh, that Croesus talks about. Uh, so he kind of says Bitcoin adoption right now is like 0.0001% if you measure Bitcoin adoption based on the individuals who store more than half of their net worth in Bitcoin. And I think that's how we should measure Bitcoin. Um, so that's one form of measuring Bitcoin adoption. It's like 0.001. Then there's a more kind of broad way to uh, measure Bitcoin adoption. And this is more uh, people who have said, you know, yes, I use Bitcoin um, in like a survey. So whenever you Google like, you know, what's Nigeria's adoption yeah. rate, it will tell you 30 or 40 percent. And that's that's just it's just asking people, you know, have you used yeah, Bitcoin? It's it's laughably high exactly it's, it's, i agree i agree laugh laughably high but i think if you use those surveys i think global adoption is somewhere around 15 to 20 percent and i agree that's too far to the bullish side um when you when you look at you know nigeria at 40 percent sri lanka at like 15 20 turkey at 15 20 i think it's more somewhere in between so i think true adoption rate is probably more like uh five to eight percent right now so we're getting really wow. close to that kind of tipping point um, and I think a, a really big trigger uh, for igniting uh, the, the trigger point is going to be what happens to Bitcoin when there's no Bitcoins left on exchanges. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's a couple of things there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Again, I agree with you so much. I think those surveys are bogus. Yeah. I don't know who is doing them, but it's just so obvious because it's like you can just look at the number of Bitcoin wallets and it's like, off by like a factor of 50 or 100 of what these surveys say. Like, oh, one in three Americans use Bitcoin. <laughs> one in eight Americans use Bitcoin. It's like, I don't know what these people are smoking, but anyway, <laughs> or how they get published yeah. in Forbes and Bloomberg, but they do somehow. And they probably make more money than I do. <laughs> you may <laughs> <But>, both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But <laughs> but anyway, I agree with you. Those are probably too high. But I mean, I, I don't even know if we could just pick something on the middle. You said you kind of just arrived at five to eight percent, but Again, if we assume there's 5 billion adults in the world, so not even people, but just adults, 5.3 billion adults, 8% of that is roughly 40 million. Mm. And, you know, we could just look at Bitcoin wallets, Luke, and there's nowhere close to 40 million. There's more like 4 million people that have 1% of a Bitcoin or more. And, you know, I, I know that people in developing regions of the world won't be able to afford nearly as much as people in the in the West and in the, uh, you know, more economically prosperous areas of the world. But it's like, if if we just say that, okay, 8% of 5 billion is 40 million people that are Bitcoin adopters, quote unquote. But the, the verifiable number of wallet addresses is 4 million. And we know that most Bitcoiners probably have at least two or three wallet addresses. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't see 40 million or 20 million or even 10 million I, I don't know. I don't see any evidence for that. So where do you get the five to eight percent from? Yeah, that's interesting. Or is that that's interesting? You have yeah. to send me what you've seen because I've seen a few different papers uh, based on on-chain data that uh, there's somewhere between 100 and 200 million users. So maybe we've been looking at. Well, well, are, are, are we talking about like non? Like, like, are we talking about sums like above one US dollar? Or are we talking total wallets? Because I'm talking about wallets that are actually in use, like active wallets, along with wallets with a sizable sum on them whether we're talking about 100 or ten thousand dollars or 100 million dollars like I, I believe the ones i've seen just look at it holistically all wallets doesn't matter how long they've been active or non-active uh and the and the amount is irrelevant so somewhere between 100 to 200 million but but is a wallet that was created by someone just, just because people create wallets all the time like i've created wallets that i've never used i mean you know I, i've created multiple wallets i mean can we really count each one as an additional person i i don't know if we can 
so i mean you know perhaps this is all just semantics and debate and i think we're all at the same conclusion but i i don't know i i think i i think we're years ahead of where you, you think we are i think that's at the end of the day where it comes down to and to a certain extent i hope you're right because that means bitcoin goes up a lot sooner but on the other hand if i i really hope you're wrong because if we have over 130 fiat currencies to collapse in the next seven years i i think that's catastrophe um, i know a lot of bitcoiners might disagree with me but i hope this is as long of a transition as possible mm -hmm purely for the sake of my own generation and the people currently alive today. Because even though the current system is causing suffering and pain, I think if we were to transition just like that, it would be so fast, so destructive that it would just be really, really hard on people. I think the longer Bitcoin has, the, the better for the network and the better for the world. Because that means that it's a more natural progression with market cycles to go up and down. It's more time for average people to buy. Um, you know, what, one of my concerns is right now with what Russia and the U.S. are doing, how the U.S. wants to tax mining excessively, and it seems that Russia is figuring it out slowly and mm -hmm. steadily. So anyway, there was multiple ideas there. But yeah, I, 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 love, I love your hopium. I, I, just, I just don't think it's going to be – I think it will be that fast. I just don't think it will be that soon. Mm. That's probably the best way for me to put it. Hey, I hope I'm wrong too, brother. Um, I've got my money where my mouth is, though. I actually yeah. left Australia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because I believe that if we do see a very rapid Bitcoin adoption, uh, the nation state could get a little bit uh, even more tyrannical the same way the church did uh, when, you know, we separated the church and state. There was a whole, you know, the Reformation and uh, the, the, the uh, revolution back then. I, I think Bitcoin monetizing very rapidly will cause a similar separation of uh, money and state. And uh, I want to have optionality. So I'm just hopping around here in Latin America. Um, I, oh, really? I, I didn't realize that, that you moved. So you moved from Australia to El Salvador or Guatemala, wherever you are. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Be because, wow. Okay. I, yeah. So you do, you do have your money where your mouth is and your house where your mouth is. So. I do. I, my house as well. Yes. No, I, I really, yes. I hope I'm wrong. Cause I think it's going to be, uh, uh, less volatile. Obviously we have a longer transition, yeah. uh, but, uh, there's lots of competing arguments as well. I've heard a few, uh, notable Bitcoin and say, uh, a rapid transition is good because it stops the theft sooner. So I, I think. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I've heard that. Um, Knut's one of them, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, you know, and he and I have talked a little bit back and forth on Twitter. I, I, I see his point. So I don't want to say disagree with him. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I mean, the, the reality is this is going to have transition costs. You can't have the internet be globally adopted without first the death of every other global communications platform in the world and likewise you can't have the monetary singularity of humanity be adopted without the necessary demise of essentially every central bank and every centralized banking institution in the world and i want to be clear it's not me shaking my fist saying oh we got to end the fed we got to crush everything it's like it's not a matter of me going out there and shouting we have to do this it's just a matter of inevitable game theory and adoption of that we have two systems one is much better than the other and for it if we have two technological systems one is much better than the other and for it to inevitably be globally adopted the inferior system has to die and it's almost certainly going to die at an exponential pace you know what one one example i give is like that of farmers upgrading to the industrial revolution it's like you know before the industrial revolution with factories you know 95 98 93 percent or so of people were in agriculture farming and of course, the upgrade to the Industrial Revolution was a very good thing, but the unfortunate reality is that for the vast majority of people in that period of time, it was very difficult for them. Because I mean, think about what they went through. Their farms were falling in price because with machines being able to more efficiently use the land, the value of that land you know, per unit was having significant trouble. And, and additionally to that, uh, their profession, not so not just the land they were using, but the job itself of farming uh, was becoming less and less scarce and valuable in the workplace. And the crops they were selling is becoming less valuable. And in order for them to keep up, they have to educate themselves and learn how to go to the factory and learn how to go to the big city and you know, upgrade their brain basically to this new set of information. But what is everyone else trying to do at the same time? Everyone is having their farms go down. Everyone is trying to have the upgrade. So it's like, you're in one system that's that's declining at a faster and faster rate and the transition costs of going to the new thing 
gets only more dramatic the longer you wait. And so, you know, I, I want to be very clear here that obviously the new system is better than the former system. Factory jobs, even though we look back at them today and think they were barbaric, factory jobs are much safer than working on a farm, especially for children, especially uh, for women, especially for people that were hurt on farms. Factory jobs were much better um, for them and, and safer for the lifestyles um, and arguably healthier. I mean, that, that, that's more of a debate. But, but anyway, the, the metaphor being to today is that obviously a Bitcoin standard, in my view, is much more preferable to the current fractional reserve system. But if the transition is even faster than I'm concerned it will be, I mean, it, to me, that's just like incalculable amount of confusion and despair for billions of people. And I think the transition is going to be hard enough anyway, because I mean, one way to put it is that we're all drug addicts. We are all addicted, the politicians and the voters alike. We are all addicted to free, cheap money that just manifests out of air and violates the law of conservation of energy. And we are going to have so much withdrawal from that system that I'm worried that if the globe faces withdrawal too fast, that we will resort to war or we will resort to fighting each other. I think we need to endure the withdrawal pains as slowly as possible, even if we have threat in the mean even if we have theft in the meantime, to prevent desperation and anger from boiling over too much to where we have war and revolution. So anyway, it, it's it's I'm more or less I'm agreeing and disagreeing. I'm agreeing that if this takes longer if this takes longer, we're going to have more theft, but if this happens virtually immediately or incredibly fast, I think the probability of humans thinking less intelligently and humans acting on emotion and doing something we can't undo uh, becomes much higher. So that's a brilliant point. Anyway. No, that's a really, really brilliant yeah. point. I, I I hadn't given that one a lot more thought, you know, really rapid transition yeah. could make a Russia or a US, uh, you know, make a very irrational decision. Yeah, yeah. Well, if it happens fast enough that the politicians and the, and the powers that be won't have realized that Bitcoin is better and won't have realized that actually the future is really bright and we don't need to resort to desperation. But if it's so fast that they don't realize that and instead they think that this is the end, you know, screw it, let's just do something. Mm. You know, again, it doesn't matter. Like, this is a human thing. This isn't a political thing. You know, perhaps politicians get too emotional and they push the big red button and nuke a few cities. <laughs> or perhaps we're talking about citizens that have violent revolutions in their countries and, and cause all sorts of food supply cascades. And, you know, I mean... At the end of the day, I don't worry about it too much, or I try not to, because I believe there is very little we can do to stop it, because at this point, it's all game theory, and the cat's out of the bag, and one way or another, this thing's going to get adopted, and there's no central point that we can do to stop it. Yeah, I agree, Luke. Uh, the cat is certainly out of the bag. Now, I want to be a little bit respectful of your time, Luke. We've been going for well over an hour, uh, nearly an hour and a half now. We've had multiple uh, intermissions due to technical uh, uh, in incapabilities on my side. So I want to be respectful of your time, Luke, and uh, begin rounding this thing out. Um, what are your plans for the future in the Bitcoin space? You've had a pretty rapid growth. Uh, what do you want to be doing in the Bitcoin space in, say, three to six months' time? Yeah, I, I've gotten that question a lot, to, to be honest. I don't know entirely what all could happen or what, you know, therefore what I hope to do. Uh, this is really kind of come out of the blue for me over the last month and a half or so. So I'm just exploring it. Uh, the threads have been really popular. Uh, these podcasts have been so much fun to talk to people such as yourself who I've watched before and, you know, had my agreements and disagreements with and to be able to like, you know, discuss that with people. That's been wonderful. I, I just met Greg Foss. He's one of the top five or seven Bitcoiners for me. So that was great. I'm excited to meet Jeff Booth. I have my first Bitcoin Magazine article coming out next week, so I'm excited for that. I think people will like it, uh, and I, I don't know. I'll see what else comes my way. I'm going to a uh, Bitcoin conference in Miami. I'm going to thank God for Bitcoin conference also in Miami, and I'm going to mass adoption in Boston next month, so I'm going to that. If people are in the Massachusetts area, they can stop by and see me there, and I... I made, I made it to Bitcoin Lake recently, and I hope to go back for a longer period of time and in a year or two from now, uh, perhaps the next halving, we'll see. But, but anyway, yeah, as far as what I hope to do, I'm on Twitter, I'm on YouTube, 
and I've spent most of my time on Twitter. I have plans for YouTube, which I don't know if I want to really go too much into that yet, but I, I have some cool things I think people are really going to like. And basically right now, I'm just happy to be part of the community. And I know that when the next halving occurs and I know when demand begins to spike that, you know, kind of like we were saying earlier, I know that a day is coming where the demand for Bitcoin educated people will be extremely high. And so my goal is to create as much content as many useful things as I possibly can for when that day comes and there are incredible numbers of people that want to learn an incredible amount of information incredibly fast. And so basically do my best to be a source of signal in a future world that's going to be really, really noisy during the transition. So I appreciate people's support. I appreciate people following me and liking everything and watching everything. It's the compliments are really, really nice. I do have a few haters, but that's okay. And I, I hope to be a more value in the future, both for Bitcoiners and especially for those that are not yet on a Bitcoin standard and are still relying on their political institution to store their economic value. Luke, I think that's a brilliant note to end it on. Thank you so much for coming. It was great. We disagreed on some things and we, I think yeah. we agree on most things. So I had a ball yeah. um, with this podcast today. So thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you very much. This was quite the blast. Thanks. Okay. Oh, and you're a Noster too. I, I should yes. tell the listeners to... Yes, Noster. Noster. People hounded me. Like, you got to get on Noster. And I did get on Noster. And I got to say, Noster's kind of nice. The zaps are nice. People mm. are really really nice over there and there's so many less spammers um yeah it's, it's very interesting it's fun to experiment with that but i'm not abandoning twitter or anything else yet simply because that's where that's where all the people are that need to hear the bitcoin message so anyway yeah they can find me there too we're both on nosta come check us out we're shit posting over there and we're trying to post <laughs> some educational content alongside the shit post so i'll leave it there thank you so much luke and i hope you all have a good day thank you good night